Clone woke up. She packed her bags. She brushed her hair with a brush she had found lying on the dirt a few months ago. She paid her food and housing bill to the tavern keep and walked to the edge of town. She then flew on her broom to the sulfurous sea. This time, she had a job. A town as close to the detested sea as it would dare be had a river that flowed into the ocean and a ship ready to set. Its cargo was classified and its purpose was classified. Clone really did not care what the ship's deal was. She just cared about the deal was offering. 25 gold to those who took the job and only the strong visit of the strong will be accepted to take it. Apparently, the ship was one of the few ships that still sailed across the sulfur sea and needed strong escorts to keep it safe as it sailed from beasts and any other threat. Clone did not consider herself to be one of the strongest out there. She simply had seen too many powerful beings. A golem that shot multiple laser beams a second, mowing down armies. An amalgamation of flesh that nearly killed her with advanced weaponry, dark magic, and even missiles. The DLG, of course. Calamitas, Dradon, Yarn, his dragon, and so many others made her strength look like a weasel in comparison. However, she was well aware that she was no ordinary human in power. Finally, she landed in front of the boat. The boat itself was not particularly large. The crew of twelve was gathered on the dock playing some sort of game on it. The boat itself was far from the city, so perhaps it was there for privacy of work. Look, the first escort is here, one said, seeing Clone land on the dock. Can fly too. At least, we know one of them is strong, another piped in. The whole flying in a broomstick is, isn't it Calamitas's thing? I heard the last person to steal her mojo got burned, burned up. I don't we need to worry. The captain, wearing a black trench coat and with an eye patch covering his eye, stood up. You are one of the escorts for the ship, then. Clone responded with a yes, then took a seat leaning against the wooden column, just as another trailed behind her. The person was difficult to make out at first, but once they finally landed, Clone could see who it was. Clad in silver armor, with odd blue wings that retracted as they landed, they didn't pause to walk forward. The wings, as one could call them, were makeshift looking. The leathery webs of feathers and some sort of bluish-white substance were strung together between a foundation of bone, Clone was certain, that comprised the skeleton of the wings. The wings were simply a machination that the person wore, trolled by some complex machinations. Clone looked back to the crew to see if they wore the same confused face she did, and saw that the wings were just as alien to them as it was to herself. The person pulled a golden stopwatch from his pocket. Clone knew very little about how time is measured. She simply used the position as a, of the sun as a way to track time, as the devourer of gods had taught her. So she had no clue what the man was talking about when he said, The time is six in the morning. I'm on time. Where are the others? The man had a helmet that obscured his face, but he was undoubtedly a man. We should be expecting a third, the captain responded. Do we must wait? Yes. The silver-clad man started to walk forward and seemed to glance at Clone, quickly averting his head to the crew instead, then even quicker back to Clone. After a second of observation, he took multiple staggering steps back and pulled a massive brown trident that seemed to be made of some sort of carapace from his back. Y you! Are you whomever you think I am? Rest assured, I am not her, Clone said, in a determinedly annoyed tone, placing her cheek on her closed fist nonchalantly. However quick he could throw that trident, she could fly faster. For whatever reason, the man simply stopped, nodded in acknowledgement, put the weapon back on his back, then sat opposite of Clone without another word. What was your name again? The captain spoke. Call me Levite. Some time passed. Levite was reading some book. Clone was chewing on a loaf of bread, and the crew was growing restless. A man finally came bursting out of the woods, yelling and running like his life depended on it towards the dock. Dashing after him was a massive purple slime, leaping forward into the air and barely outspeeding it. Levite swiftly pulled out the trident again and sat up. I'll take this. He walked to the slime as if to throw the trident. 
and hesitated, and put it away as the man ran past him. The slime leaped into the sky and seemed as though it was going to hit Livy, until he pulled out a necklace that Clune could only recognize as a blue and gold sphere attached to a chain, where the blob of slime halted its attack, falling just short of Levit. Don't attack humans, and go away, he said, rubbing the slime's membrane. The creature, which was hardly sentient, simply did as he said, and scuttled across the ground back into the woods. After the situation was diffused, Levit turned to the newcomer and started speaking. Slime see using tremors caused by their jumps, so you could just hug a tree and it wouldn't know any better than to assume you were a part of it. You could also hide in water. Slime slowed, so it couldn't catch you there. I'm sure you could have easily saved yourself that way. Oh, well, that's good to know. He paused for a moment while he looked around, observing a chunk of people, chewing his cheek. My name is John Caliver. I'm the navigator. Who are you all? Levite. Clone chimed in. Clone? Release its miss, the captain said. The rest of the crew made their rounds as well. The large input of information was too much for Chloe. She decided simply to remember those names. Finally, as the last person was finished saying their name, a gunshot fired from the forest. A moment later, another man came out of the woods, splattered with chunks of purple slime and holding a brown and white lofty gun, adorned with a red scar. Oi, that slime was pretty nice, Levit called out, as a flare fell from the sky and planted in the ground. Like I care, the man responded. He walked up to the river and splashed water on his face to get rid of the slime. The name is Reginald. Clone walked towards the flare. She had never seen one before, and she was curious about it. The flare was small, barely bigger than a bullet shell, and looked like a sparkler slowly fizzing out. That's a firestorm cannon, right? The fire captain said, staring closely at Reginald's weapon. Yup, the man finished washing the slide with. It's no joke of a weapon. It has two modes. The shotgun mode. He pointed the gun at the river and shot. Clone could see tin flares burst from the gun simultaneously and splash into the water. And it has a stream mode. Reginald pulled some levers and mechanisms in the gun. When he next fired it, the flares came out regularly and quickly. Nice, Merlisi said. Janssen boat. That's everyone. He started to walk up a large platform onto the boat. The rest of the crew followed. Then the navigator, Clone, Levite, and Reginald walked onto the boat. The boat set sail, and a few hours later, they finally left the river and sailed into the Sulfurous Sea. Clone was rather interested in the navigator's work. She frequently asked what John was doing and why. John, after a few hours on the ocean, asked the boat to stop and pulled out a piece of paper and a metal coiled string with a golden spear at the end of it. The string was rolled up on a clamp, and it had a lever that let the string fall. The paper, Clone could tell, was a map of sorts. Jean also had multiple pencils that were each colored different shade of blue. He adjusted the clamp so that it would hold onto the railing of the wooden boat, then quickly turned the lever so that the string would fall into the ocean. What are you doing? Clone inquired, testing the depth of the ocean. He pointed to laminated tags on the string that marked 50 dm, 55 dm, 60 dm, and so on. Why do you need to do that? A few reasons, John responded. Firstly, ever since those abyssal creatures rose to the surface, the seas have been dangerous as it gets. His hand suddenly was harmlessly shot by the wire. That's 70 decimeters. Stop the ship. He looked at the map, which upon closer inspection was a map of the ocean, the outskirts of the map being light blue, and the middle largely being black blue and black in some places. Then looked at the captain. Steer the boat to the port side. That should keep us in safe waters. He turned back to Clone and continued as he reeled the line back up. Those creatures have been at the surface, but they still don't leave the areas that they started in. The boat started to move. So, because the dangerous creatures originate on the deep side of the ocean, as long as we avoid where the ocean is deep, we should be rather safe from those creatures. 
Of course, there are some terrifying creatures on these shallow waters, but they don't attack humans since they have lived on the shores for years. Unless, of course, they are attacked. While Clone was not in her free time, she was employed to fight, fly far above the boat with her broom, looking at the horizon for dangers. It was during that time that she saw a worm arcing over the surf ocean surface, not necessarily towards the boat. The crew started to turn the boat farther away from the worm's path, but Clone had other plans. She flew beside the worm, following it near its head. The worm was seven, several hundred meters long, blue, and had spikes protruding from its body every dozen, couple dozen meters. Its head was not much larger than the body, and had four eyes, as well as a massive pincer that could crush a boat in an instant. Clone, upon catching up with the head, started to converse with a massive creature. Is the meat fresh? Clone said, expecting a response. According to the devourer, worms had their own culture, and if she had ever met one, there was certain greetings that would convey goodwill. That particular phrase was asking if there was game in the area, or if there was just meat to be scavenged. The worm did not respond. Perhaps, Clone thought. It didn't notice or over all of the water it was kicking up. She decided to do something to get its attention just before someone snagged her wrist and started to drag her back to the boat. Levite was frantically trying to drag her away from the worm, and Clone led him for a moment, confused as to why he was panicking. Get away from that scourge. Last time I met one of those, it tried to kill me, Levite said, clearly concerned. Clone snatched her arm away, then flew in front of the worm and raised it into the air. Levite tr gave up trying to drag her back and simply kept his distance. The worm, as it passed Clone, suddenly changed direction and made a U-turn to pass by her hand. The meat is fresh, it responded, as it glided past her hand, just close enough for Clone to touch it with her hand as it passed by her. Clone had to duck as one of the spikes passed by her head. She was about to give Levite some snark but she noticed he was already gliding back to the boat, barely able to keep flying. Clone said to the worm, Do you mind following us in the deep waters as we talk, kin? The word kin was simply a way to show understanding, rather than meaning blood relation. Clone was also aware that worms, unlike humans, had evolved to be comprised of numerous species that could communicate somehow using the current language humans use. It raised several questions in her head as to the origin of worms, but the devourer never had answers for her. If the eldest worm knew little, she doubted any others had answers for her. Of course not, kid, the worm replied. Company is always appreciated in the darkness. Merlisi sat on a chair, leaning against the railing of the boat, looking at the ongoing situation. He had no idea what was going on, and it bothered him. The Scourge was clearly not interested in attacking the boat. Why did the escort courts have to go and bother it? The witch had crews near the worm, and he could overhear her yelling over the silent arcing of the er Scourge. Then, Levite, the one with the odd wings, had flown over to the witch, and he could see him trying to drag her back to the boat. Now he was flying back forced to glide from overexerting the mechanical functions of the wings. As he struck the midway point to the boat, Merlisi heard a terrible concoction of noises coming from the worm. It sounded like it did not belong in this world, but he knew that was all the world sounded like, deep beneath the waves, where others of the worm's kind lurked. Even after the terrible noises flooded his ears, the witch stuck with a scourge. The crew was all gathered on the edge of the opposite railing, observing the madness from closer. Levit finally dropped to the ground, forcing the crowd to part as he dropped from just above their heads and rolled, seamlessly transitioning from flying to walking towards Mercili purposefully. What's going on there? Melisi said in an unreadable mis mixture of tones. She is speaking to the scourge, Levit responded as he propped himself onto the railing next to Melisi. And why is she doing that? Can those things even compute words? Sort of. I hear all their chit chat loud and clear, but all of you like are likely hearing clicking noises or whatnot. 
The concoctions of clicking noises, as the escort had described, began once more and took longer to stop its mind-rattling noises. It just said, Company is appreciated in the darkness. And what do you suggest that's supposed to bloody me? I'm not sure, but I'm sure Clone knows. Clone was cruising back to the ship on her broom, sitting on the edge of her seat. The worm was close behind and came uncomfortably close to the boat, its massive body making the boat look small by comparison. Clone finally dropped to the deck, forcing the odd crew to part once more. Clone flew to the boat and landed in front of a wide-eyed crew gathered at the edge of the deck. The boat had stopped, and the navigator was taking the spare time to measure the ocean depth. She walked up to the captain, who was fingering a cannon and leaning against the railing next to Lovite, clearly nervous as he saw the worm slowly arcing next to the boat. Lovite was doing some sort of maintenance on his makeshift wings, while he indulged in some conversation she couldn't quite hear with the captain. The worm is willing to escort us, and wants me to help it catch some big game in the deep waters. The captain gave an incredulous look. At what? Are you telling me that you just asked one of the creatures we need protection from to protect us? And since when were those things anything more than beasts? You certainly want to attempt fate with that thing? Clone wished he would just assume she knew what she was doing, but explained regardless. I asked if it wanted to accompany us to the deep parts of the ocean to save us some time. She continued to answer each question he asked in order. As far as when they gain sentience, I know ever since the DOG came about, the worms have started to gain more sentience and power. A smirk started to appear on her face. And as far as how certain I am about asking for its assistance, she continued in a smug, unconcerned tone, with the same smirk on her face, I am sure enough to bet our lives on the good worm's goodwill. The smirk grew into a smile, and she chuckled a little at the joke, looking up to see if the captain thought it was funny too. He, as it happened, had some mixture of expressions on his face, including anger, concernedness, and fear. Clone was simply disappointed he didn't like the joke. She actually heard the slightest chuckle from Lovite, although she was not sure if she had imagined it, as it was difficult to imagine the stoic man finding anything funny, let alone laughing. Then again, perhaps he was far from stoic. She had never seen his face before, so he could actually be super expressive. She doubted that was the case, however. Fine. Navigator! He yelled at the navigator, who was still rolling up the metal wire, entirely oblivious to the happenings around him. The navigator turned around quickly. Yes, sir? As his face turned upwards, it slowly became mortified as he saw the massive worm arcing past the ship. Can we save some time if we go through the narrow deep? The navigator paused for a few seconds longer to take in the situation. Uh, yes, if we go through the deeper waters, we can... Get there, perhaps. He looked at the blue map once more. Four hours quicker? Good. Apparently that worm wants to help us out, or whatever. So charge course for the mirror deep. 